Welcome back for our 5 p.m. Bible study tonight. Tonight's going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to look at a particular text as it relates to our 37th anniversary as a church. Uh, do be in prayer for me as um, I'm making choices and decisions regarding where to go for our Bible study uh, next week. Of course, we know that we finish up at, uh, our study in Galatians. And so I'm asking the Lord for wisdom and direction as we consider uh, next week's Bible study and where we will begin. Maybe I will be preaching a little bit on topics for a while before we actually settle down in the book. Hopefully, by the time we get to June, we'll be able to come together again and have our normal 5 p.m. study. I'd like to direct your attention this afternoon to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Now, if I say to you, <clears throat> wow, Ben and Jerry's ice cream is out of this world. Uh, then you know what I mean, right? It's an idiom that we're using in our language that communicates that this is the ideal ice cream. It is extremely good. There's nothing in the world that compares to it. That's why it's out of this world, right? That's what we're saying. Now, I haven't really had any better ice cream than Ben and Jerry's, except for maybe Hagen does, but but, but Ben and Jerry just nudges it out a little bit, right? But, but when it comes to the quality of our lives as Christians, um, we can draw a line of comparison. That is, every day that I live my life, I increasingly find that the life that I am living is out of this world. You say, well, what do you mean by that? What I mean is, it, both idiomatically and literally, life for the Christian day by day, ought to be out of this world. When it comes to our church, I want your lives to be out of this world, increasingly satisfying uh, as you develop in your relationship with the Lord God. That's my burden for you as we consider our anniversary this year. Jesus prayed the night before his crucifixion, the prayer that we see here in John chapter 17. Most uh, people... Uh, believe, Bible scholars believe, that this is the Lord's Prayer, the great and high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jesus is going to leave his disciples on earth. He, he dies, he is uh, placed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and then he rises again the third day. He is seen uh, by his disciples, he, he wanders with the people and uh, for 40 days, and then they gather at the Mount of uh, Olives and he ascends up into heaven and the angels promise that he will return in like manner. So as we think about that, he, he prays just before all of that is about to take place that his disciples would be kept by the Father there in verse 11. Now, my question is, are we to imagine that he did not have the disciples of Heritage Baptist Church in mind when he prayed this in verse 11. You say, well, he really was talking about the apostles. Yeah, he was, but he certainly had us in mind. That is, the, the Lord Jesus has definitely prayed to the Father that the Father would keep us here at Heritage as well. Did he not pray to have his joy fulfilled in us as well as the apostles, as he says in verse 13? Do, do we not have God's word, even as Peter, uh, John, and Paul did in the first part of verse 14 here in John 17? Does not the world hate us because we are not of the world, just as Jesus and the apostles were not of the world? Maybe, maybe the world doesn't hate us, right? You say, well, why doesn't the world hate us? Well, maybe the world doesn't hate us because we're not as bold as our first century counterparts were. And so if you're not bold and if you're not going out against the world and bringing the gospel to it, then you won't see much by way of uh, people being contrary to with you or even um, rejecting you. Jesus did not want any uh, of us uh, to be taken out of this world. He didn't want that for his apostles. He doesn't want that for us. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because we are here right now. We're in this world. If Jesus wanted us to be taken out of the world, he would have done it by now, but he hasn't. So he prays that we would be kept from the one who energizes this world in verse 15, namely the evil one or the devil. And so as we mark our 37th anniversary as a local church, 
I want to challenge all of us with the words that are found in the 16th verse of John chapter 17. John 17 and verse 16, and there we read the, uh, the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and notice that this isn't just asking uh, when it comes to this prayer, but there are things that Jesus is stating. So he says, they, the disciples, are not of the world. Now somebody will say, criticize people who are praying sometimes, and they'll say, well, God already knows that. Why are you praying it? Well, Jesus sets down a pattern here. <laughs> I mean, we can't pray everything that Jesus prayed in John 17, but certainly there are going to time. There are going to be times when we are making logical reasoning uh, statements uh, in our prayer to God. Otherwise, we're not really relating with Him. All right. So they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Okay. That that's the text. It, is it is this not the truth for us as a church today? Just as it was a, a truth for the church of yesteryear and all through the generations from the first century to the 21st century? It is. We are not of the world just as Jesus is not of the world. If we live life per pursuing the approval of the world, we will not have the approval of God. Uh, if we live life um, with the approval of God, then we can be sure that we will face the disapproval of people in this world. Why did Cain hate Abel after all? It's because they were going two different ways. There was the way of Abel and there was the way of Cain. And that way of Cain, according to Jude 11, is the way of the world. It's the way of rebellion and disobedience. It's the broad way that leads to destruction. So our Lord Jesus said to the apostles that the world would hate them because they would not conform to that world. Instead, they were being transformed by renewing their mind uh, in what Jesus had taught them. But the fight, of course, is real, as we think about our church and the anniversary here. Jesus has given us God's word as a church. And so it's important that I, as a pastor, keep us grounded in the word of God. He prays that we might be sanctified together by God's truth. We're not asking uh, what Pilate asked, what is truth? And, and going through some kind of philosophical meandering when we gather together on Sunday. We know the truth is here in God's word. God's word is truth. And so we believe that that is what brings into our lives an eternal quality to them. So verse 16 here in John 17, really, it preaches itself. You have two parts. Jesus is not of the world. And then secondly, Jesus' disciples are not of the world. And, of course, we are the disciples of the Lord Jesus. Let's consider this first aspect of the verse. Jesus is not of this world. We know what this doesn't mean, right? It doesn't mean that Jesus didn't love people in the world. Of course he did. It doesn't mean that he was joyless and dour as he went through his life. He was not that. He followed his earthly father, Joseph, as a carpenter. He worked hard. Now, the Bible certainly indicates that he enjoyed mending and building things for, for people in this work because of principles of work. We know that he did. Even if we don't have it explicitly recorded, we know that he did. Attending the wedding uh, there in John chapter 2, we see him loving people that are in his family and extended family and friends and sharing times of joy with them. Uh, all of these things. He loved his brothers. He loved his sisters. He loved his mother and his earthly father. And, and so we could say, we could sum it all up by saying that Jesus definitely lived, loved, and laughed in the world. And, and we need to acknowledge that. So he did all of these things, but he was still living an eternal quality of life in the temporal world around him, a temporally tempting world, constantly pulling at him and, and attempting to derail him from doing the Father's will. Now, he did what he did with two holy pursuits in mind. Jesus lived for the transformation of his followers. And Jesus lived for the treasure of his Father. The transformation of his followers and the treasure of his Father. First of all, the transformation of his followers. He was seriously uh, minded when it came to a constant regard for his Father and, and the life that he was living. He, he always considered others against the weight of the decisions he made in this balance on the eternal scales. And he always did it perfectly. 
Uh, he is God with us. So this is no slapstick Jesus in some kind of a sitcom situation. There, there was always the weight of deity upon the Lord Jesus and in his presence among us when he walked this earth. And so time was important to him. It, it was something that could not be wasted. He could not be deterred when he set his face like a flint and headed toward Jerusalem for the last time. His goal was to do the will of the Father, and his goal was to do that will for the glory of the Father. And so we should never forget what his earthly work accomplished for us. It, had, it has loosed us from our sins and given us all of his righteousness. It is in this way that Jesus lived for the transformation of his followers. Second, Jesus lived for the treasure of his Father. Now, we, we shouldn't think uh, that Jesus never found pleasure in the world. He did. The pleasure itself is not evil, right? We, we should not think that Jesus didn't earn money in the world. I, I believe he did. We, we shouldn't think... That, that Jesus was never respected or honored in the world. Obviously, he was. Look at, look at Palm Sunday and what all that was about. So what then? Well, Jesus simply never treasured these things, right? These were things that he did not treasure. His food was to do the will of his Father. And so there is a very important principle Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to treasure, right? Uh, he taught us not to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because when you do that, you're, you're laying up treasures in, in a place where they will be corrupted, where they will slip away from you. Instead, he said, we ought to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. The treasures in heaven are important. And so you say, well, why? Well, we can give a lot of different reasons why, but, but here in, in what Jesus taught, he, he confined it to this. He said that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, what he's saying there is our hearts, all right, whatever is in our hearts, that is what is governing us in life. And so if our hearts are filled with heaven, then it will be heaven and the will of the Father that direct us. If our hearts are filled with the earth, then we will be governed or directed by the earth around us. When it came to Jesus, uh, of course the Bible is very clear on this, his treasure was to do the will of his Father in heaven. And so whatever his Father treasured, that's what he treasured. This means that Jesus did not treasure pleasure or possessions or prestige. In instead, he treasured the will of his Father. The very things that he utilized uh, in order to advance his Father's will on earth have become the things that are snares to his followers today. They were not so when it came to him. Jesus did not live, for instance, for treasured pleasures in the world. You say, what do you mean? Well, Jesus could have focused his mind and his body on any aspect of creation and pursued it. And, and by doing so, he would have been unfettered from really, by any weakness or sin, from enjoying those pleasures. The, the depth of his intellect, the power behind his righteousness, uh, that would have come down into his emotional life and afforded him pleasures that are simply unreachable by you and by me. So nothing derailed him from coming to do what the Father sent him to do, not even pleasure. His greatest pleasure in, in his life was accomplishing the will of the Father for the glory of the Father. That's why you could say in this prayer, I have glorified your name. And so, he came to this earth to die for our sin. Jesus did not live for treasured pleasures of the world. Second, Jesus did not live for treasured possessions in the world. He commanded a fish uh, to bring him some money so that he could pay the temple tax that Peter and himself owed. And so that's pretty amazing. Do you, do you really think that if he could do that, that if he desired more wealth, he couldn't work miraculously in order to have it? Certainly he could have. But, but instead, he looked to gain his provisions from women who were following him, according to Luke chapter 8 and verse 3. At the end of Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, Well, if you're going to be 
my disciple. He's challenging would-be disciples at the end of that chapter. And one of the things that he says to them is, if you're going to be my disciples, just realize I have nowhere to lay my head. Right? So for Jesus, he didn't have a house to live in. He didn't have a, a nice room where he could call it his office and a and, and nice chair and desk and then his own master bedroom with a, a, an ensuite bathroom or, you know, all these things that we treasure in our world. Jesus did not have these things. He had no place to lay his head. And by the way, if he had money, then we know what he did with it. He gave it away. <laughs> he gave it away to meet the needs of the people around him. Jesus did not live for treasured pleasures or possessions in this world. And third, Jesus did not live for treasured prestige in the world. There were huge crowds that came to Jesus. He had influence over many of those crowds. He could have used that influence in order to get them going in a direction and gain some momentum and, and, and take that direction in the way that the zealots at the time wanted to take it. He had great power in his hands in this potential following. But when he garnered a very large following in John chapter 6, he said and did everything he could to get rid of these followers. <laughs> you know, you say, well, not really. But, but, but it's true. I mean, when he gave the hard teaching in John chapter 6, he taught them that he would have, they, rather, as his disciples, would have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Now, of course, we know what the Lord Jesus meant. They didn't. It was a hard teaching for them. They, they turned away from the Lord Jesus. Even the 12 apostles uh, were eyeballing this idea of forsaking him. Jesus asks the question, are, are you going to turn away from me also? Uh, Peter gives the right answer, and the disciples follow in turn there, the 12. Uh, but, but in the end, they don't, right? Um, when it comes to Peter, he denies the Lord three times. Uh, Judas Iscariot uh, betrays the Lord. And the other ten uh, run away when uh, he needed them most. And so he's left all alone in the end because he didn't treasure prestige when it came to this world. So Jesus didn't live for this temporal world. He lived for eternity, and by doing so, he gave us the mindset that we as believers need to have today. This is why to know him and to know God the Father, this is why that that is eternal life, John 17 and verse 3. They are not of the world, Jesus said, just as I am not of the world. So let's move away then from this idea of Jesus not being of this world and talk about the fact that Jesus' disciples are not of this world. We learned in our final uh, study of the book of Galatians that Paul said that he was crucified to the world and the world was crucified to him, that double crucifixion in Galatians 6 and verse 14. That's the way that it must be for all of those who would follow the Lord Jesus Christ from the first century to the 21st century. This brings home three powerful realities for us. Number one, we are not preoccupied with worldly cares. Number two, we are not preoccupied with worldly company. And number three, we are not preoccupied with worldly calling. You say, well, what do you mean? We are not preoccupied with worldly cares. Uh, you say, well, we're not sinless. No, we're not sinless as disciples of Jesus. We, we haven't purged uh, ourselves of every ounce of worldliness, and, it's, and, and we're not going to. All right? we, we, we have to face that reality. There are times when you laugh at something, and you know you shouldn't be laughing at it. I've, I've done that as well. There, there are times when I've been anxious about making a particular payment, and, and I know that I shouldn't be anxious because it's sinful. We struggle with dominating sins that pop up every now and then, and we have this flurry where we're binging on things that we shouldn't be binging on. But all of these things as Christians, when they happen in our lives, when they erupt in our lives, they bother us. That's the difference between uh, a disciple of Jesus and somebody that is in this world. We are bothered by the way that we're living our lives. And so there is something in every believer that drives him or her toward daily deliverance. That's why we confess our sins daily or even the moment that we commit them because we want what brings really true satisfaction into our lives. We want transformation. We want the presence of Christ. We want revival. We want to change. We want the spiritual blessings that he has promised us, the grace, the mercy, and the peace that he has promised us. We want all of those things. These are far greater than any material blessings that could be brought our way. 
We are not preoccupied with worldly cares. Number two, we are not preoccupied with worldly company. We are not preoccupied with worldly company. We, we certainly have to deal with the people that are in the world. And we have to be side by side with them. We work with them. We work among them. We shop with them. We enlist in the armed services with them. We vote with them. We go to the movie with them. We, we eat with them. But, but, now, understand what I'm saying here. We are not really with them. And that's why I miss coming together as a church. Because I'm with you. And I know that you are with me. And so, we are not with the world. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? And the answer is no. They are not friends. Now you say, well, should we be friendly toward them? Yes, we should be. Go out and have coffee with people, trying to evangelize them, looking for opportunities in the neighborhoods around us. But they are not our friends. We are friendly toward them. We are kind and we are compassionate. But our allegiance is not to them. Our allegiance is to our Father in heaven and to his children, the sons and daughters of God. That's where our allegiance is. We, we know that light cannot have fellowship with darkness, that Christ cannot have fellowship with Belial, uh, the devil. So a believer cannot have fellowship with an unbeliever. We are not with them in that particular sense. We are perfectly willing, even as Moses was, to suffer the affliction that we feel with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to, to identify with a suffering Savior. We're perfectly willing to do that rather than enjoy the pleasures and the honors of high society or whatever. So we are not preoccupied with worldly cares. Number two, we are not preoccupied with worldly company. And then number three, we are not preoccupied with worldly callings. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, we are not apathetic when it comes to being a part of the citizenry of the United States of America. In other words, many of us are patriots. I would count myself as a patriot. I would be willing to die for my country and for the freedoms that it represents. I want freedom to be on the march when it comes to this country. But, but we also um, are working for, for corporations and companies that, that are worldly. Right? And, and we know for the most part that this nation is filled with worldly people that are not as self-sacrificing maybe as we would tend to be. And so we work hard to uh, save money for worldly bosses in worldly uh, corporations. I don't think there's anything uh, wrong with that. And, and these corporations advance worldly agendas and they move in a direction that we wouldn't want to move ourselves. But, but we are not driven by these things. The, thing, the same thing that dr drives the owners of the corporations we work for are not the things that drive us for the most part. Now, there are godly uh, people who are very rich and godly people who are in places of power, but for the most part, um, we uh, are, are not in those positions. And yet, we are driven along by what is coming down from us from the Father of lights. It is heaven that is always our focus in life. We understand that true pleasure is at the right hand of God forevermore. And that's where we are headed, right? We spend a lot of time with the things of this world. But our preoccupation is with Christ. Nothing should change this. So, as we move from our 37th anniversary to our 38th year and our 38th anniversary uh, next May, let me direct our thoughts to another year of service here to Antioch, Brentwood, and Oakley and the people around us. And let me remind all of us that we are not of this world, just as Jesus is not of this world. So what should we do as a church to make the year ahead a successful one? There are three things that we need to do that undergird all of the idea that comes with the great commandments, and the Great Commission, to go out into the world to preach the gospel, to see people saved and baptized in our church. That's what we're about. And to follow both the first and second commandments, to love our God supremely and to love others as we love ourselves. There are three things that we can do. Number one, we can be sincere. Number two, we can be single-minded. And number three, we can be sanctified. We can be sincere. There are, there are many people who claim to follow Christ and, and we've known some of these people, and yet they turned out to be the enemies 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem is they struggle. They struggle with this idea of setting their mind on earthly things. They called Jesus Lord, Lord, but they didn't obey him. They didn't identify with his sufferings. And all we can say is, you know, a tree is known by its fruit. If we belong to Jesus, we are going to be conformed to him, not to the world. But joy and hope are not found in this world. And we need to believe that. They, they are found where Christ is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. We are sincere in this. Our private and public lives align to attest to our sincerity. We are Christ and we have crucified the flesh with the passions thereof, Galatians 5 and verse 24. We are sincere. Secondly, in closing, we are single-minded. Integrity demands this singular focus uh, as far as private and public moments are concerned. We are set apart from this world. We have already been sanctified in that sense, right? That doesn't mean, though, that you and I are odd or unapproachable, that we don't use gifts that God has given us, maybe personality changes that are among us, the winsomeness and the charisma that some people have and the boldness that some people have. God uses all of those things. And so it simply means that when the world's path diverges from God's path for us, we don't follow along with it. That's what it means. And so, when I'm looking at this idea of being single-minded, I know that I am salt and light in this world, first and foremost, and you are too. And so, as salt and light, um, we are here to preserve. We are here to illuminate. We are here to bring truth into the world around us. And so, people see in us a love for the Father and not a love for the world. Love for the world means that the love of the Father is not in us. You say, well, why? Because all that is in this world, according to John, in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, all that is in this world, the pleasures, the possessions, and the prestige that I talked about, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these are not of the Father, they are of the world. We cannot fix our hope on things that are passing away. We need to treasure the things that Jesus told us to treasure. And our singular focus is to do the will of God because that is what abides forever. If we want to be a friend of the world, James tells us, then we're going to be an enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. So even if our focus is merely split, we are at odds with what God's plan is for us and for this world. You can't serve God and mammon both material things. We need to be sincere and we need to be single-minded about this as individuals Then we'll be more powerful as a group of believers. And then finally, we need to be sanctified. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renewing your mind what does that mean? It means developing the mind of Christ by being washed daily in the water of his word and by asking for the Holy Spirit to claim more territory in your life and, and, and that you'd be filled with the Spirit and to have the same love that Jesus had and that we'd all have that love, that we would all have that same mind, that we would all be of one accord. The selfish ambition and the conceit would give away uh, give way, rather, to the selfless service of Heritage Baptist Church and, and humility, genuine humility within Heritage Baptist Church. The haughtiness and the arrogance will give way to the lowliness of mind that a Philippians 2 uh, speaks of and the esteeming of uh, others better than ourselves. We'll put our self-interest on the back burner and then we'll start paying attention to the interests of other people. Sanctification, that is spiritual maturity. It's becoming more and more like Jesus. We get there through the word, through the prayer, uh, through the energy of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we read in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, Come out from among them and be separate. In other words, be sanctified, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will, I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty such a great passage. In other words, be sincere. Be single-minded. 
Be sanctified. Be sanctified. In short, be separated from this world. We are not of the world, just as Jesus is not of the world. Happy anniversary, Heritage Baptist Church. Let's pray together. Father, we have your promises. We are set apart from this world for you. The Lord Jesus is at our right hand even now, so we shall not be moved. We find security here, Jesus with us. But Jesus is also at your right hand interceding for us, preparing a place for us. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let our focus be on eternity as a church. Then our hearts will be glad, and the glory that is ours, thanks to Christ, will find a place of rejoicing deep within us. We will rest in hope as we live for you. Bless our 38th year ahead of us. We shall know that you have prepared both a place and a body for us in heaven. You will not leave us in the grave. Jesus did not see corruption, and we shall not see it either. Thank you for life, for the eternal quality that characterizes it now, and help all of us to see it and to live it. Help us to know a quality of life that is out of this world every single day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. Pray that the Lord will bless you through the week, and we'll see you here on Wednesday as we look at our fourth message, uh, I think, there in, um, in, well, no, our third message in learning how to pray together. God bless you. Bye now.